All right, gentlemen, how to uh, how to set this up? Well, it's extremely late at night, and uh, we've been hanging out here at uh, this cabin, sort of snowed in, kind of uh, overview hotel style, talking about evolution with two scholars of different fields. Uh, many viewers of this channel are familiar with Dr. Luke Gordon, the University of New Mexico, my uh, longtime colleague and friend in Indo European historical linguistics. We're also joined by Matthew Campbell, who is a, uh, well, professionally an animator, but I would say, if this is a term, a semi pro paleontologist. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> right. This is a good movie. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, but long involved in. Um, the Morrison Natural History Museum, where we both have a lot of history, uh, as a is the term docent. Do you use that term there? But it, it's kind of like a docent, like the field chief, docent, lab tech, yeah. all that jazz. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking about <clears throat> parallels between biological evolution and linguistic evolution, kind of about how not only like the mechanisms might be similar, but how people might have similar misunderstandings about both. So to start with, I mean, one idea that we were, we were kind of bouncing back and forth is that I think a common misunderstanding of evolution both ways is this notion that it's something linear, that it has one starting point and one ending point, and also generally the ending point is sort of better, or maybe worse. This sometimes happens with people thinking about languages, is like later is worse. But, uh, you know, like, like this, there's this objection to evolution that's so old that like, well, if we come from chimpanzees, which is also a super oversimplification, but this is how people put it. Yeah. If, if we come from chimpanzees, how are they still chimpanzees? Yeah, you hear that a lot, um, which is a fundamental misunderstanding of how it works. And similar, like, you guys would get something like that. And what I would like to use when people say something like that to me, like, they're still X, Y, they're still Y, is if we speak English, then, like, again, um... Why is there other languages? Like, how did that start? Like, there was never a Spanish speaker that's, or Latin speaker that gave birth to somebody that spoke Spanish. Right, right, right. Two different languages, because just how it branches off and then kind of go on to that is normally what I would like to use to kind of showcase. And their way of thinking is inaccurate and also a good example of something that happens today, like language. Yeah, you don't have a parent who speaks Old English and a child who speaks Middle English, right? But, I mean, this also speaks to the fact that our own professional categorizations reflect a distortion of the truth. We have to sort of know that when we're categorizing things like that, that we're sort of distorting it, right? Yeah. I mean, in the same way that there's not like some, oh, this is where you're going to get me, some archosaur morph that gives birth to the first dinosaur. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, where, where do you draw that line? I mean, I've always actually kind of wondered about this in mythology, right? Where the Norse gods are descended from their enemies, the Jotnar. So which one is the first god? Like what makes that mating the one that produces a god when the other ones didn't? Uh, it, there's just, yeah, there's not, there's not a clean dividing line you can make between generations or, or probably between species. Yeah, the notion of like doing that is actually kind of inaccurate too because species is such a weird grade where a lot of people will just say up the bat the species is animals that uh, no longer could mate together, but then there's a lot of counterexamples. Like if you go through all Canada, then like can a spotted dog still mate with fertile offspring for a dingo and other things? It's like, yeah, they kind of can, but they're different species. So drawing that line is really weird um, uh, because of the gradient. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if somebody, you know, like, um, Back in the day, I was speaking something that would become something that will become Spanish. Was speaking to somebody that was hard line, like dividing like their Latin language. They could probably still understand each other. Might sound funny, same way that species might recognize, like, hey, I could probably mate with you. You look a little different, but it doesn't matter right now. And then later on, that divide like happens to such a big expression, where now you're getting Spanish, like hard Spanish, and then they, they meet other groups, other people, and Hey, maybe I don't, I understand some stuff, but it's a different enough language, a different enough dialect. I actually am speaking where we now draw the line. Hmm. Something we'd now call French or now call Italian or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's like, you know, I, I, it's interesting even in, among genera, right? I mean, I know there are some bird genera that, that can mate. 
yeah. mean, hummingbirds of genus Salisphorus uh, have been known to interbreed with hummingbirds of genus Calypte, and they don't, actually don't even look that much alike, but they do. So what does the genus distinction even mean there? Um, basically because when it comes to actual science, we don't really even use species. Um, that's, mm. that's a nice like way of uh, kind of really identifying something specific. But for the most part, species does it's a garbage tax and it doesn't mean anything. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, genera, like, again, is kind of where we would start now, like, drawing a harder line, right? Where it's just like, okay, this is, even though some could friendly mates or infriendly mates or see each other as possible candidates for that, um, the distinction, right, in genera is big enough to where we could start saying, okay, let's start, let's start divvying this up. Even if, like, they can, are they separated enough? Um, can a polar bear be with a grizzly bear? Yeah, of course it can. Are they separated enough? Yeah. And then we start sure. drawing the lines there. Sure. Huh. Well, I guess those are the same genus, right? Mm -hmm. Versus Arctos? Versus Sorbilus? Something like that? I don't know. I think it's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, what what I'm saying too is like with hummingbirds, you have cross genus. Yeah. Right? Like that's, which I guess is not supposed to happen. It's the forbidden genus. The forbidden genus. <laughs> now, now in linguistics, um, you know, we, as we were just talking about, we have this, we we have this issue where we say, okay, languages are different languages if if you know they lack mutual comprehensibility. But of course, as we were just talking about, it's more of a gradient than anything. So uh, almost everyone would agree Spanish and Italian are different languages. Yet oftentimes, people speaking them have a fair amount of, of mutual intelligibility. Not a hundred percent, but they, you know. They almost sound like different dialects of each other, which, of course, from a Latin perspective, they are. Um, so sometimes it, when we think of different languages, maybe not among professional linguists, but among lay people, most people, th there is often an, el an element of politics in deciding this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if two groups decide they don't like each other, uh, they might decide that their dialects are actually different languages, even if they're mutually intelligible. Right, um, right, right. And, and sometimes vice versa because of politics, where groups that might not be mutually intelligible might be decided to be one language because some central government wants to say they all have one language or something. Um, so, so politics can definitely play a role in linguistics. I'm curious as to whether politics plays a role in deciding whether something is the same species or, as you just said, maybe throw species out the window, even the same genus. How, how cut and dried is that decision to, to say something is different than species or genus, given some of the issues that, that you were just bringing up. Yeah, so again, like, we're definitely throwing out species because I don't think any scientist would agree that that's a valid thing. That's a garbage tax on. But yes. for um, uh, getting to the genus, yeah, it definitely comes down to, again, um, taking a look at, let's say, an extant animal. A, a couple of years ago, there's a new um, clade of whales that were named, right? That broke off. Whales? <laughs> Damn, bothers me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, there is politics in play where it's just like, okay, and now we have to, I like, see exactly why like we would want to split them like we know that they hey, they have common ancestors even in our lifetime and they'll, they'll dive in and say okay huh, they're separated. Good <laughs> they would um a gr uh, like either on what niche they're participating in like some of the amazon river dolphins recently splits because like some are hunting way more in salt water some are hunting way more in fresh water and to the degree where if a fresh water river dolphin which is the same species from its like brothers when it start hunting in salt water, it will start like actually getting affected by it. It will start like hurting the skin. It will actually be affected by it. So at that point in time, where like there's something even smallly tangible, hmm. you can now do that. Hmm. So um, it does come down to politics again. But um, and the further up you go in taxonomy, it's easier because like sure. those small expressions and they're not like, radiating bigger. But yeah, it just comes down to that. There's a new species of mosquitoes. In London, um, that live in the tunnels only, and again, that was the same exact mosquitoes as the ones above ground. But the reason why we decided to cut that as a different species, a different like gradient, is because their behaviors are so different than their brothers. They don't like if they were to go up, they're diurnal versus nocturnal. They wouldn't recognize them, mm -hmm. even though they are the same. Hmm. So it does come down to politics. I think the language parallel to that that's most salient is probably Chinese. Because, of course, you look at Cantonese, Mandarin, um, I used to know the names of more of these. We call them dialects, but there's mutually unintelligible as English oh, yeah. and German. Yeah. Um, but then I think, you know, you're, what you're talking about with something like 
a mosquito population that lives in the tunnels, so we're calling it a different species because it's isolated, even if it's not morphologically different. I think that there's a good argument for calling something like Pennsylvania German its own language, even though it's mutually intelligible to some degree with German dialects back in Europe because of its isolation. It is developing on its own. It is separated. There is a line drawn physically, geographically between the population speaking it. So did, when you say that species are kind of a garbage designation, is it preferred often these days to say like, you know, instead of genus species, Tyrannosaurus rex, is it generally preferred to say like Tyrannosaurus spa? Is that like how people like to talk about it now? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, it does have a place like, colloquially. Like if you're talking about uh, scientific or if you want taxonomy or phylogenetics, it doesn't have a place. Uh, remember, all Canis lupus familiars are one species. Right. But um, um, realistically speaking, like this, you could get into weeds and be like, I'm talking about a Dachshund or a Greyhound. Um, Did you say Dachshund? Did you say it. Dachshund? No, no, you don't. No, 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 I, I've, no always heard, I've always heard Dachshund. Yeah. Oh my God. That's what I've actually heard. Like when I was a kid, I heard it, I, and I, I, I thought it was spelled D-O-X-E-N when I first Dachshund. heard it, because I always heard Dachshund until I saw it spelled, and I was like, oh, a, I mean, I was like 10 years old, but you know, yeah. Okay, so we got we got some uh, we got some linguistic diversity here. <laughs> like off the bat, um, uh, but uh, yeah, so clearly yeah, the, these things do matter, and then like especially how we like to categorize things, sure. But scientifically speaking, um, definitely not. It's arbitrary, almost like races, where you'd be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm African American, I'm Asian, and so like, we're all Homo sapiens sapiens. End of story. Like if we had to never skin and we found our skeletons, there was zero difference. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of how we look at it. Huh. I guess I wasn't aware about that, and I, I wonder if there's actually an argument for a linguistics parallel there. Like, I mean, how often is it almost more useful to talk about, like, in like in my particular sort of subfield here, like Scandinavian spa, right, as opposed to, like, trying to make a dialect Norwegian or Swedish or Danish? Because really what we've got in Scandinavia, it's kind of an interesting situation. Over the past 2,000 years, these languages have been developing sometimes in isolation and sometimes in contact so that we have a weird combination of like really distinct features on different ends of the peninsula maybe but then things that all of these varieties share that maybe they actually didn't share 2,000 years ago but that have spread because they're all in contact with each other so it's sometimes actually really hard to draw the line if you're not talking about the standard language between like this is definitely Norwegian this is definitely Swedish because you have dialects that are on the border that are like I don't know what to call that mm. um and then you have something like, you know, quote unquote, standard Norwegian, which I have to kind of say quote unquote for standard Swedish, standard Danish, which are really like the Oslo Scandinavian spa, the Stockholm Scandinavian spa and the Copenhagen Scandinavian spa. Uh, I wonder if there's some, some argument to be made for using kind of analogical talk about that. And I feel like you can kind of do that with some crack rates in India if you had, if I had or, or romance varieties. Yeah, I right? think so. Romance spa. And then you get down to like I guess sub genre sub like the sub level right mm -hmm. where that's kind of where it would live. Well, and I mean just like in biology, you get down to the individual, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, your exact genes are different from my exact genes, are different from his exact genes, and your exact English is different from my exact English is different from his exact English. But we all agree that we're human. We all agree that what we're speaking right now is English, even though you would never descend to the level of using the irritating "qu" thing. Uh, but you know, that's. That's individual variation, idiolects, just like uh, just like individual variation in biology. And if you think about what the word species means and where it comes from, it kind of goes with what you're saying, honestly, because it just comes from the Latin root "spec," which means mm -hmm. to look. Mm -hmm. So you look at something and it looks different. So it's a different sure. species. That's not very useful, right? Because lots of things look different that could reproduce with each other or are actually are very similar but just happen to look different in some way oh yeah no. so so etymologically the word species when you think about it is actually not not uh, that useful no oh, and then the opposite end of the spectrum like you have some things that are they might look similar or so, like, yeah. wildly different yeah and you have no idea how close they are like if you yeah. asked a random person on the streets it's crocodiles closest living relatives lizards turtles birds. Mm -hmm. it's birds, it's birds. <laughs> they don't look yeah. anything right. alike that's an excellent point
well, that, that sometimes that scientific evidence really can be surprising in, in what it groups together. I mean, another one of those is probably, you know, my latest discovery, those Sicilian things. Yeah. They look like worms. They do. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. look like weird, like, amphibian worms. Yeah, that's the one of the weirdest things I've ever heard about in my life. Oh, I, I can I'm fascinated by crazy. this and this parallel evolution thing where they like feed their young. Yeah. Right. I mean, with the secretion that they make out of their cloacas or whatever, it's like no, that, that's the. <laughs> that's, well, but but actually, I mean, in a sense, that kind of brings us back to one of these parallels where you have this like parallel evolution, right? Yeah. I mean, linguistics features parallel evolution too, not just the fact that people use the same onomatopoeia for a lot of familiar concepts. Like it's kind of a familiar universal that around the world a lot of words from other have ma in them because babies are smacking their lips early on and we like to interpret that as meaningful ah uh, but you even have well i mean maybe some of it is common structure in the brain this could be kind of a chomsky in point but languages tend to have nouns verbs as distinct things they don't always have adjectives as distinct things but uh you know they tend to sort of when you learn about a new language from a new language family if you're familiar with, say, half a dozen different language families, you're not going to be utterly shocked by the way the language structure works. Like, oh, it's agglutinating. Oh, it's isolating. Oh, it's inflectional. There's certain things that languages kind of tend to, to trend toward, and I think biological evolution is kind of the same way. Oh, it's a grazer. Oh, it's a top-line predator. Oh, it's a fisher, whatever. You know, these. I, I think it's kind of interesting how you hit the, Yeah. How oh, we have that conversion evolution where, like, you'll see over and over again repeating patterns that, like, kind of make sense to kind of fill that nation. It's like, oh. And then we, like, you know, the further back in time, it's like, no, oh, it was kind of similar to this, or this is doing that, or... Yeah, take take yeah. a beef from the modern day and compare it to a triceratops from the late Cretaceous. <laughs> you want to explain what the <laughs> hell you're talking about to everybody that's listening to this? <laughs> take a beef. <laughs> yeah, what species is that? Well, a beef is a species. Uh, a beef, a beef, beef, beefus, beefus. A beef is the animal, the female of which is a cow, and the male of which is a bull. The uncastrated male of which is a bull. That is a beef. Okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to drag all of my little linguistic things that annoy you into this. Uh, yeah. Your French ancestors would be proud. I don't know that I have any, but uh, linguistically, you apparently do. Maybe, maybe Le Beef from True Grit would be. Uh, hey, where, where does the name Beavis come from? I've never looked. Beavis? Yeah. Like, like in like Butthead? MTV? Yeah, I don't know. Well, it's a real name. Can we, they, say, they that on, make it can we say that on YouTube? Uh, <laughs> we say I don't know. We're about to find out. <laughs> Get a copyright? I don't know where that comes from. Off the top of my head. It might actually have something to do with beef. Um, I know where the other one comes from. Hmm. Um, but, but take a beef from the present day, at any rate and compare it to a triceratops from the late Cretaceous. I mean, that's a really similar niche in what they're eating. Not that there's grasses. Per I guess there's grasses. There, there was grasses in late Cretaceous. Late Cretaceous. There's not grass in the Jurassic. Nope. But there's grass in the Cretaceous. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and it fills that same niche. Um, you know, like those big herding animals. Um, it's a little harder to kind of uh, vision that because uh, all, most all the cows are now are decim decimated, are domesticated. Um, uh, so uh, the genus is boss, and then we have species like Angus Taurus, but if you look back to the common ancestor, the British Arnock, that thing, those longhorns, that is a triceratops. That is a mammal oh, triceratopsing. Yeah. If no way fans or butts, those um, prehistoric Arnocks are monsters. Yeah, those are fearsome. I've typically heard the, t that's an, that, I, I've typically heard the term orox. You're saying Oranox? Oh my, are you getting on me, Whale Boy? Like, is, is he getting on me now? Like, oh God, like let's, let's pretend you didn't see that one. That's, that's Whale Boy to you. <laughs> you know, one of the rune letters is named for that animal. Really? Yeah, it's Ur in Old Norse. How's it? Like, I guess, go from that to Whale. No, it's not the Whale, it's the Oranox. Oh. Which is interesting, because Olaf is the ox yeah, the yeah, horn yeah. so the very first letter of the alphabet so clearly an important animal well ur is the second well when you actually it's the ur animal is that weird yeah <laughs> the first letter of the runic alphabet is is in old, old norse fe which is cattle and then ur so you go from hmm. domestic to wild cow but there's no further pattern i mean the third one is thorn uh, 
so huh yeah but now to your i'm point. thinking about runes <laughs> and beef uh, and but beef. yeah to and your beef. point always no, about beef things that are comp like not related by a long shots same patterns yeah yeah to the point that it's misleading i mean well or, or or think about i think this is a really interesting example is is just how uh if i may hazard a spiffy term how um <clears throat> uh, phylogenetically diverse uh the creatures are that are embraced by the term riftile oh yeah um uh, for the most part reptile can be garbage but if we're talking about reptiles then i automatically assume you're talking about diapsids so okay yeah. well so lizard snake arc arc but that includes birds yeah and but then like you have some some lizards some of what we call lizards are more like snakes than they are like other things we call lizards right Crocodiles are more like birds than they are like lizards, even though morphologically people would say they look more the same, right? In fact, I guess when you get down to it, you know, a salamander isn't really that close to a lizard. But Not like, at all. But morphologically, they're very similar. Yeah, if you were to look at it again, say that, oh, niche, but they're very, very different. Um, it could be... A tuatara is another thing you could throw in there that's actually really different but looks morphologically similar. Yeah, you know, take one look at it and it's like that is a hundred percent a lizard, but not at all. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just showed it to me and say lizard, but you look at its skeleton, it's like, oh, this hasn't been a, this hasn't been anything close to a lizard for five hundred million years or whatever. Yeah. But but I, actually, that brings up another point that I thought was really interesting. You were mentioning earlier that I think has some linguistic parallels. Is you were saying that when. Well, you put this better than I, than, than I would, but to simplify this and clarify this for me, if, if you if you want or need to, when a certain group of synapsids that was on its way to becoming mammals had a problem with the, the lack of, what is it, like the, they had a gene for producing yolk in their eggs that was turning off, something like that? Yeah, um, so this is well after synapsids, though. So, okay. um well, after synapsids, um, this actually is after crown mammalia. Um, and all, all you need to be a member of crown mammalia is mammary glands. So this is after that. But um, we were still laying our eggs. To, um, the problem was our eggs were whittling down our yolk. So if you look at modern monotremes, these are animals like the platypus. Like, next to no yolk, they come out soft, super soft shell born, and they still have to lap up their mom's milk. So when it comes down to us theoriums, we had, yeah, it was initially a problem where we had run out of yolk, stopped producing yolk, and then we had to overcome that in different expressions. Like it was a, this is a problem. So we have things like allotheriums and monotheriums and then us placental mammals, which was a virus that helped us to develop a placental so we don't need yolk. Hmm. Weird. A virus helped? Yeah, the placental um, was caused by a virus hmm. which happens a lot um uh, keep in mind um when it comes to evolution it's a lot of people just automatically assume it's a genetic mutation so that is a form of it right you could have an expression like that could be like your alleles changing that it's a mutation it's a copying error and if it's good or bad or benign which is normally the case constantly pass it over and then that could be a form of evolution but a lot of times Things like viruses could come in and literally retroact our DNA, and that was another one. Hmm. So, yeah. well, I've heard some ideas that uh, multicellular life evolved from single cells consuming other single cells and then becoming symbiotic with one another, something like that. Yeah, I mean that one. That one is I want to say nail in confidence, but uh, that one's pretty well like cited for sure. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's weirder to think about because, like, when you think of eating cells, you automatically think, "Oh, yeah, you know, leads to animals." No, chloroform is an enslaved, um, uh, different cell inside a plant. Those cell walls are quite literally cell walls for a reason. And you're keeping chlorophyll in there, like for like uh, same thing with us in like uh, mitochondria. We form that bond, <laughs> engulf it, incorporate it, keep it there. And that's it. Huh. Kind of weird to think about. It is weird to think about. <laughs> I don't think there's a linguistic parallel to that, but I was thinking that when you describe the three different ways that mammals, and maybe there's more ways that we don't know about that were tried in different evolutionary dead ends, but three different ways they tried to overcome that, that yolk deficiency with the allotheriums developing these 
what you call the weird birth sack. The, the copyright mar- guy. Okay, copyright. <laughs> yeah. you know, here's here's some royalties. Um, the marsupials developing their disgusting pouch. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if it's age restricted, but uh, marsupials screw um, you, Australia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are very disgusting. Yes. <laughs> and uh, placental mammals developing obviously their normal wholesome way of doing mm. this. Um, like how God intended. But it's <laughs> like eating without salt and pepper. Uh, but I mean, language is the same way. Like you see something like, say, the breakdown of uh, the, the gradual breakdown of the case system as you go from Proto-Indo-European to a lot of the descendant languages. Different descendant languages are going to do different, really different things with that, right? So I mean, like in India, you see languages that develop an ergative structure out of the remnants of the case structure. You see languages like English that have almost entirely abandoned it except in the pronouns you know i me but we don't do that with any other words you don't say like knife nominative and knife accusative there's no that, that it takes me weeks to explain that to students in a class um you know it's and and so it's it's interesting like you sort of see almost like these random steps it's like the the, the language or the speciation like throws itself against the wall just trying whatever will get it through the, the hole that leads to the next step and it always makes me wonder about the ones that don't make it, yeah. right? I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by dead ends, right? I mean, my own life being a prime example, <laughs> but like, yeah, <laughs> sort of. But, uh, you, you know, like this, al- like uh, allotherians, right? Like this, this group of mammals pursue a completely different reproductive, well, not reproductive strategy, but a different like birthing like, strategy, nutritional strategy for babies. I don't, I don't know how you put this exactly. Yeah, birthing strategy from other mammals actually nearly outcompete placental mammals oh, at yeah. one point, right? I mean, the that's most massive. successful mammals to date in terms of species numbers. Right? Um, uh, time on this planet. Oh, time on the planet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. How much further do we have to go? We could double our time on this planet as placental mammals and still not come close. I wonder how optimistic to be. <laughs> I don't know. This actually might be a good time for your rant about how dinosaurs suck and mammals are more interesting. But uh... <laughs> it's gonna be a separate video. It's gonna be an hour long video <laughs> on what the objective facts of reality. <laughs> but I'm a bird guy, so I've got to take the dinosaur side here. And I mean, like that—that's birds have a weird language too. So I've caught you, but. Um, I mean, I've seen several videos of cutting. <laughs> now we're getting demonetized, so we can say whatever we want at this point in time. <laughs> but, I mean, I've seen videos of uh, ravens that not only communicate, but um, to an astounding degree, where they're using different... Uh, I'm not talking about ones that, like, parrot us, which yeah, they yeah. understand what we're saying, but talking about them in almost their own language, where there was a raven communicating with another raven, and they had, like, ganged up... Um, communicatively on us other raven like, like and it was weird as filmed in a zoo but they were using um different calls that they've never heard and after they they talked they formed a strategy uh, i'm gonna like uh, was it uh be the uh, distraction come from behind and like it was a well orchestrated attack it's very bizarre oh i believe raven's talk i believe stellar's jay's talk um and another thing relevant to to, to birds is I was just thinking you know it still shocks people sometimes when you just make the statement that I think is at this point uncontroversial except for that one guy who writes that book that gets into every museum gift shop for some reason uh, birds are dinosaurs right but like yep. this is just as surprising sometimes as some of these linguistic conclusions we come to if we just follow the data and don't let our feelings direct it like Romanian is a romance language like that's surprising like you would never expect that or Swedish is closer to Hindi than it is to Finnish. You know, you wouldn't expect that, but that's a linguistic fact, right? And I think sometimes that just being able to follow that data to these interesting conclusions is, is leads you to the most interesting facts about life on Earth or, or how people or ravens <laughs> talk, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a little round table for you folks. It's the kind of thing that we sit around and talk about when we're watching the snowfall and... Uh, just burning the midnight oil and uh just a regular wednesday night for us here yeah here high up at what ten thousand eight hundred feet is that what you said 600 yeah ten thousand six hundred feet yeah yeah we'd show you more of it but uh like i said it's extremely late so 
There's nothing to see except piles of snow on top of the grill. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for sitting here and thank you talking to me a little bit. And uh, hope you folks enjoyed that. Check out the rest of the videos in this channel about language history. There's 900 something videos in this channel. So if you're if this sort of talk is something that you could sit through, there's 900 more videos you would also sit through. Stay uh, tuned for the hour rants, right? <laughs> On why mammals are super. I'd sit here for it. <laughs> All right. All the best, beautiful Colorado. <laughs>